My name is Bob Bonamano and I'm an IGA retailer from Easton, Connecticut. I'm also the founder of the Help Save the Butchers program. Now as an independent retailer, I've always believed that Perishables has a place in our business and I built my business on it. And I knew when my customers walked in my store that they should be able to expect certain things from me. And that is that the meat they bought was fresh meat, that it was 100% pure meat with no additives, that they were able to buy hamburg that was ground fresh today in my store for meat that was cut fresh in my store. That they should be able to get special cuts if they wanted them, and that there should be someone there knowledgeable, like a real butcher, that they could talk to. Now, as Steve said, I am a butcher myself. I've been cutting meat now for over 44 years. I started in a little butcher shop in Rhode Island and ended up working for the chain stores. Ended up with First National in the Redwoods Food Warehouse Division. I ended up with them for about nine years where I used to set up and manage meat departments, did in excess of $250,000 a week. Now, believe it or not, back then I had 21 meat cutters working for me. Does anyone know of a store today with 21 meat cutters in it? Dying trade. It's not really, okay? It's still available business out there. My expertise was operations when I was with First National. I was the guy they put in the back room to make sure the production got out and make sure that they cut a gross profit. But I always knew I wanted to be in business for myself. And it took till 1984 with a $5,000 income tax refund check and my father-in-law's co-signature before I finally found a store that the banks would finance. That's the store. I'm not sure there's very many people in this room that would have taken a chance on buying a store that looked like that. But that's the store I managed that did $5,000 a week in meat sales. Now it turned out to be an okay thing though. At the end of the first year, we bought the building that we were in, and we ended up remodeling the whole store. We ended up putting an addition on it. And believe it or not, the original owner of that store, I think, had visions of grandeur. In that little store, he had three back rooms. He had a meat back room, a deli back room, and a produce back room. First thing I did when I squared off the store, put a whole new outside of the store, a whole new roof on it, is I took out the back rooms. I made it all retail space. So that way there are customers would have a little bit more to shop from and open up and get the people that were working in the store away from the back rooms and out with the customers. By the year 2006 in that exact same location, that's our store today. And the store does very well. Now over the years, we've been able to build our business and everything and we've done several things with several stores, but this is our main store that we started with and the only one we have yet today. But when I was preparing for the seminar, I said, I wanted to be able to tell you how I went from that old store to this new store. But more than that, I want to tell you why it took me so long, from 1984 to 2006. Well, I came up with several reasons, or maybe excuses about it, but within three and a half miles of that store, we have quite a bit of competition. We always have had. I have six major competitors within three and a half miles my, of my store. A Stop and Shop, a Big Y, a Price Right, a BJ's, an Aldi's, and a Walmart Supercenter. Never mind mention the two dollar stores and a lot of small stores which we call bodegas in our area. First 10 years of business, we concentrated on growing our business instead of building the business in the individual store. I went up to four stores in 10 years. Two of them were 14,000 square feet. One of them I built brand new. Two of them about 5,000. That's what Windenham ended up being over the years as I kept adding on to it. And I was trying to be everything else that my competition was. I was trying to be a grocery store full market basket. I don't know if you guys come up against this in the size of your individual stores, okay? But when you're trying to be the uh, full market basket store and you're the smallest guy in town like we still are today, it's pretty hard to convince my customer I'm the right place to buy groceries, okay? They automatically perceive me as being more expensive. What I really found out back in the mid 90s when we went back to one store, reason I wasn't building business was I lacked a well-defined identity of what I stood for. And being perishable was what my expertise was, and especially the meat department. Back in the mid-90s, we started concentrating on our perishable business instead of our full market basket business. And we ended up growing the business in our meat department and our total store. And Wyndham ended up becoming known for the quantity and quality of meat that is sold. Our old store at 5,000 square feet in and our new store, we do in excess of 45% of our total store business out of our fresh meat department. That defines us who we are. We would have weeks in the old store out of 5,000 square feet that we would do in excess of $100,000 a week in meat business alone. Our new store now, last year was our best year in business. It absolutely buried the year before. This year, I'm already up several hundred thousand over last year. 
And it's all due to our meat department and the rest of our perishables. Our rest of our perishables will come along with it. We exceed $150,000 a week on some weeks now in our meat department. We do several different marketing campaigns to do that. We're a big first of the month store, which means our business fluctuates quite a bit. And then we use these unique ads to help bring in volume on the rest of it. But we created a well-defined identity of what we are. When you walk into my store, as Joe mentioned, there's no doubt what I stand for. You walk in, it's a big wide open area, and the first thing you see is our beautiful produce department, our deli with a grinder bar, and three aisles of meat. That's our first aisle, on the right hand side, that's our red meat case, and you can see we're loaded for beer. That's at the beginning of a truckload sale. Opposite that case on the other end of the aisle is our pork case. Next aisle over is our fresh chicken case. Next, next to that, opposite that, is our frozen meat. Next aisle over is our awful cuts. As I said, we do big ethnic trade, big first of the month business. No doubt what I stand for. They know it right up front. I'm not leaving anything to chance. I don't want to stand there and say, I know what I stand for, and my customer doesn't. I have to tell them, and that's what I did in my business. Now, when I was preparing this, I wanted to tell you what I did do to help grow the business. And these are very basic items. And I'm sure there's a lot of great quality meat departments in this room. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm absolutely positive there are. But I had a quality meat department. But I had a quality meat department since day one. I've been cutting meat since I was 15 years old. It's all I've ever done my entire life. I, when I was working for First National or uh, Big G in Rhode Island, I would turn around and travel five different stores a week some weeks. I got to learn from five different meat cutters or as many meat cutters were in each and every store. Picked everyone's brain constantly. Tried to put them all together. Tried to do the best I could. And I did that in my meat department when I bought my first store. I always ran a quality meat department. I trained my employees. Over the years, even when we had four stores, most of the butchers that worked for me, we trained. When I worked for First National, if you wanted to be in their management training program, you had to come through my store. You had to go through my meat department. We didn't only train the butchers, though. We're going to tell you about our other employees that we trained. We cross-trained every employee in our store. Deli help knows about meat. Meat knows about deli. Produce help can go up front and ring register. Deli help can go up front and ring register. The best part is they can answer questions for the customer. We created uh, a service type atmosphere without increasing our labor. And we're going to show you how we did that. We created some unique marketing formats that the chains have a hard time competing against. And that's the most important thing. You don't want to create a sales plan that someone else can undercut you on next week and make you look like a fool, and we don't. We have customer perception as our advantage now instead of our disadvantage. When we were trying to compete as a grocery store, anyone could undercut us. We were the small guy. You walked in my front door, the first thing you said, nice store. Small, probably more expensive on grocery. Now you walk in the front door, wow, nice store. Look at that meat case. I bet they have good quality meat here. We made customer perception our advantage, not our disadvantage. We gave the customers a value. It's no good to get your customer to come in the store with an ad if you don't give them a reason to return next week. They have to have a reason to come back. You give them a reason by giving them quality product at a reasonable price. You don't give them the low-grade product at a low-end price because the customer response is, of course you gave me a deal on that. It's your lowest quality product. No, I give them my best quality product, and we're going to talk about that, at the best possible price. Next week, when they're thinking about quality and where to go to buy perishables, they think of my store. We created a well-defined identity. As much as in the mid-90s, we started building our business and concentrated on one store and did very well. It wasn't until the Help Save the Butcher program in 2000 that we started with double-digit growth. And that was the identity that made us stand out in our area. You see, Everyone in this store, in this room, I'm sure runs a good quality meat department. And I just want to define what we did as a good quality meat department. The picture that's, in that, uh, that's up on the uh, board right now, that's not from my new store. That's from my old store back about eight years ago, the red meat case. And you can see the amount of product that's in there. We're ready for business. Good quality product, if that customer took it home, we know they'd be happy with it. The trim standards are good, the presentation's good. Okay? And there's a lot of people in this room that could match that picture exactly when taken in their store. We had qualified help, good meat cutters that could trim well, knew what they were doing, could answer the customer's questions if they had them. Okay? We had good presentation. And I, maybe I get carried away being a butcher all my life, but I think of a meat case as a painting. When you look at a painting, you just don't know sometimes why you like it, you just know whether or not you like it. And when your customer comes in your store, first impression, and they're looking at your meat case, do they like your painting? 
believe me, when you look at this presentation and you look at that case, customers stand there and they go, wow, they have nice meat here. No, they haven't tried it, they haven't bought it, they haven't taken it home, but they look at the freshness of it, the quality, the presentation, the package. There's no wet packages. That case has gone through constantly. And we were consistent. We knew that if our customer went home, they said, I want to go buy Hamburg, I want to go buy a good steak, that they knew they were confident they could come to my store because it was going to be available for them. We didn't want them to say, well, it's Tuesday night at 8 o'clock and Bob's store might be out of Hamburg. No, we made sure we were consistent in our product and our presentation. So when they were sitting at home trying to make a decision on where to go buy, they didn't have to question whether or not they could come to us. Now, the problem with this all is, is just like me, there's a lot of other people running good quality meat departments out there. There's a lot of them. But it's just not good enough to be good. You need to be outstanding. You need to be something different in the customer's mind. And when I built my new store, the first thing we did, by suggestion of my wholesaler, was to put a box on the front end that says, why do I shop this store? Why do I shop here? Now, what do you think the number one reason my customers were shopping my store? I know what I thought was going to be my meat department. Of course, that's the reason they came to me. Quality, freshness, price. I had everything for them. That was number two. The number one reason my customers were shopping my store was the helpfulness, the friendliness, and the knowledge of my employees. Number one reason. Do you know how easy it is to stand out as an independent if you have good employees? Think of your competition. You ever walk into a chain store in the old days, maybe a few years back, before they started, in our area, they all got these little service cases now in the chains where they have fresh meat in them, but it's a high price meat, okay? It was hard to find someone to help you. Go into a Walmart, try to get service. Go on the front end, go through the register. Are they friendly? Did they thank you? Did they help you? When you had a question, did you say, excuse me, you know, where's this? And they said, oh, here, let me take you and bring you over and show you where it is. No, they just said, you want to stand out in your customers' minds, it comes from your employees. When I walk in the store in the morning, first thing I say to every employee is good morning. I make it a point of greeting everyone. I greet every customer when they walk in the door. I set the tone for the day. I want my employees to know that that's the way they're expected to treat other people. You don't pass someone without saying hello. You don't pass another employee, you show them respect. I want their tone to be the same. Now we hire for attitude. I'd rather hire someone with no knowledge, with a great personality, than someone that's been cutting meat for 20 years. I can teach them how to cut meat. I've done that before. I can't teach them to be friendly. Imagine an employee that we've taken, whether it be our deli clerk, our meat wrapper, our counter person, or our manager, and we say to them, you're friendly and outgoing, now we're going to teach you about meat. And the customer comes up and asks you a question, what kind of steak is good for the grill? How do I cook a pot roast? Which hamburger is good for meatloaf? You know what that value is? My God. Now imagine one employee. Imagine a store full of them. You think you might stand out in your customers' minds? It's up to us to train our employees and teach them. It's up to us to set the example. There's a chain in Eastern Connecticut that has three stores, and they were buying their fourth store, and I'm good friends with the owners. And they said, Bob, would you consult on our meat department for the new store? And I thought about it. I was going to do it. But we draw now from such a large area. My customers no longer come. That's why I don't have to worry about my competition as much as I used to. My customers don't come from my immediate area. I have customers that travel an hour, an hour and a half to buy meat from me. So I decided not to consult. A couple of weeks later, there's a gentleman standing in front of my meat case with a suit on. Now, any customer standing there looking, someone's going to ask them if they need help. And I did. And he introduced himself as the consultant that they got hired by the other chain to help them on their meat departments. I said, hey, any questions you have, just ask me. I'll be glad to help you. He turned around. He said, well, you know, he says you have a very nice meat case. But I've got to tell you, they have a nice meat case, too. He said, you know, they run a good quality department. I don't see what you do different. I said, well, you know, we just keep it fresh. We work with the customers and everything else. He says, I've got to commend you on your employees, though. On my way to the meat department, three people said hi to me. Duh. Okay, friendliness, courtesy. You want to stand out in your customer's mind. That's where it comes from. We can all run good quality departments. Do we all have good outgoing employees? Did we set the example? Did we make sure our employees are taking care of our customers? Now, the next thing we did is something that's a little bit harder to duplicate, but we did it. I grew up in a butcher shop, 15 years old, little corner butcher shop. When Mrs. Jones walked in the front door, the meat cases were here. The butchers were behind them on benches. The butcher raised his hand. Hi, Mrs. Jones, how you doing? Can I help you with something today? Mrs. Jones asked for a pot roast. I was the counter clerk at 15 pay me at $1.25 an hour. 
He promised me a, a raise three weeks later. It took me six months to get it, right? Turned around, he said to me, he said, Bob, there's a roast over there in the corner. Mrs. Jones would like a piece of that. Would you get it for her? I did the service. I took care of Mrs. Jones. I wrapped it, okay? Bobby, who was the meat cutter that taught me how to cut meat originally, he's standing behind the bench still. He hasn't left the bench, okay? If Mrs. Jones was asked after, who waited on you today at the butcher shop? Well, Bobby, the meat cutter behind the bench took care of me. Oh yeah? What was I doing? Right? We created, when we opened our, bought our store in the first year, the reason I took those back rooms out is I did not want a butcher behind a glass. I want a butcher that can talk to my customers. We took a back corner of our store, we put the meat cases on an angle like this, made a corner, we put the butcher benches behind it. We put benches back to back and every customer that walked in the door was, hi Mrs. Jones, how you doing? Now we are not a personal service meat case, we're a self-service meat case. You couldn't convince my customers of that though. They think we're personal service. We take care of every customer that walks in the door. You see someone standing there, we're gonna ask them, something I can get for you? When we built the new store in 2006, they designed the meat cutters in the back room. I said, you don't understand, you put my meat cutters in the back room, I don't build the store. That's how important this was to me. We put a three-quarter wall up behind the deli case, and that's our primal case right there. We sell a lot of primals. And at the beginning of the meat aisles, and we turn around, we put the three-quarter wall for the butchers to work at. Now, most other stores would have taken the meat wrapper and put them up against the wall. Not in my store. The butchers go up against the wall. They're the ones that have to talk to the customer. I want Mrs. Jones to say, I was personally waited on by the butcher today. This is how a butcher takes care of Mrs. Jones when she comes in. If any customer is standing anywhere near this case, just standing there looking, it's, hi, how you doing? Is there something I can get for you? Yeah, I'm looking for a three pound roast. Not a problem, let me get a few. He might send the clerk or the apprentice in back to get the roast. He stands on the bench, he turns around, he will cut it. He'll hand it to the wrapper, the wrapper wraps it, prices it, brings it out to the customer. She turns around at that point, he says, you know, something else I can get for you today? No, not a problem. We just gave that customer personal service, like as if it was a service me case, the meat cutter never left the bench. All he had to do was have a conversation and she was personally waited on by the butcher. See how important that is to me in my store? Perception is everything in business. You are what your customer thinks you are, no more, no less. It doesn't matter what you think you are. It matters what they think you are. You have to be something in their mind, something that benefits them, not you, by the way. Something that's good for them. Well, anyway, sometimes I have to feel bad for the customers because any customer that stands in front of that case for more than a minute, looking like as if they want something, is gonna get asked by every single employee that passes them. And I have to apologize to the customer. I'm saying, I'm sorry, they didn't know you already were taken care of, but it's better they ask you than they don't ask you. That's how important that is to me, the personal service, the butcher shop quality and the butcher shop image without increasing labor. Now I said, we well, do unique marketing. You can do all this in your store that we've done so far, but you gotta get them in the door. But the idea is to get them in the door without losing gross profit. Anyone can give away items and just get the customers in the door. We found some unique marketing plans that work very well for us, very well for us. This is our number one ad that we put out. We started this 15 years ago and it's called our truckload sale. Now I'm gonna tell you what a truckload sale is. I'm gonna tell you who buys from a truckload sale. Okay, I'm gonna tell you when we run them and how much gross profit they generated, how much the volume they generated. What is a truckload sale? Truckload sale, we sell whole, whole primals, whole boneless ribeyes, whole boneless oh, yeah. New York strips, whole boneless top sirloins, whole, bon whole tenderloins, whole short loins, whole export ribs, bone in. We sell whole top rounds, whole bottom rounds, whole eye rounds, whole sirloin tips. We sell a 10 pound bag of 90% lean ground beef that I'm going to be talking to you about in a little while. In our pork case, we sell whole bone in pork loins, whole boneless pork loins. We sell three pack of genuine fresh spare ribs, whole pork tenderloins, small item, but it's whole. In our chicken case, we sell 40 pound boxes of chicken leg quarters. We sell 10 pound bags of boneless chicken breast that I've heard mentioned here before, okay? Only 10 pound bags of boneless chicken breast that we're gonna be talking about. We sell five pound packages of boneless uh, chicken tenders, boneless chicken thighs, bone-in chicken thighs, uh, dr chicken drumsticks, chicken wings. In our side case, we sell family pack packages of kielbasa, hot dogs, we'll sell multiples. We sell three bacons for $7 that we're running this week on a truckload sale, okay? And our, we tie in our other departments. Our deli department sells a three pound pre-sliced American cheese plus one pound plus packages. Customer who buys certain items, a pound or more, gets a discount. 
Our produce department does 10 pound bags of potatoes, 10 pound bags of onions, five pound bags of carrots. Whole watermelons are running this week with it, okay? Our grocery department ties in with uh, four for eight dollars on cereal. 24 packs of water, maybe 10 for 10 on an item. Uh, last truckload, five butters for $10. They have to buy the quantity. I did not say we sell whole, a uh, half ribeyes. I said we sell whole ribeyes. It is a truckload sale. What it is, is we're selling primals without taking the shrink. We're able to get a fixed markup on the item. Once you cut them in half, you are not running a truckload sale. You are catering to one customer, you're gonna get it. Customer's gonna come in and say, you know, I don't want the whole thing. You know, I'm sorry, but that's what the sale is. You know, it's a great deal. Look here, you're saving $4 a pound by buying it this way over the sliced steaks and everything. You explain it to them, but you don't cut it. The customers are out there. Who buys from it? We first started marketing this. It was our customers that came in and bought from us. Those are the people that got our flyer, okay? The guy that was running it originally ran a three-day sale. And he showed me about it and he says, doing great volume, not cutting a gross profit. It's killing me. My opinion, my opinion only. Three-day sale, sense of urgency. Come in, buy my sale item. One-day sale, even worse, okay? Come in and get all my sale items that I'm making no money on and go home. Then next week when someone else sells it, go get it from them. My truckload sales seven days. It runs from Friday to the following Thursday, okay? My customer comes in on Friday, finds a great deal. We're running boneless chicken breast this week in a 10 pound bag at $1.67 a pound. That's a good price. I negotiated the price two weeks ago. The market's up 25 cents on my cost if I had to negotiate it this week. I got a great deal on boneless chicken breast and I'm making money on them, okay? Customer comes in at the beginning of the week, finds boneless chicken breast at $1.67. What do you think they do when they go home? They tell their friends and family, my God, you should see the deal I got on the meat I bought at Wyndham IGA. It's fantastic, it's unbelievable. You know, people that buy meat and fill their freezer like to brag about it. People wanna show how smart they are. And especially when you're selling them quality product. I didn't sell them chicken leg quarters at a deal. I sold them, sold them boneless chicken breast at a deal, okay? That's quality product. Next week when they wanna buy something of quality, they're coming back to my store. That's how our business built. It's a whisper campaign. We built volume. They told their friends. Their friends told friends. We now draw people that travel an hour, an hour and a half. We draw all of Eastern Connecticut, nearby Rhode Island, as far away as Providence and Cranston, where I grew up, which is a good ride. You guys got to realize, New England people don't travel, okay? Half hour is a long ride. Everything's close to us up there, okay? So for people to travel an hour to buy meat is an exception. I have customers that will come in the door and will spend a thousand dollars because they're buying for like four different families that have traveled an hour and a half to two hours to come buy meat from us. Does it work? People tell me people won't buy this in their area. My customers are different. I don't know because I have a lot of retailers that I get the opportunity to talk to and they want to tweak what I do. You want to tweak last truckload sale? I did $165,000 in meat business on my last truckload sale. You want to change it? You change it. I'm not changing. Okay? The truckload sale is what it is. The customers are out there. They are available. The best part is they're someone else's customer right now. They're buying meat somewhere else. They're going somewhere else to buy it. What happens is I can't convince them to buy grocery from me, but I can convince them to buy meat from me. So they end up coming into my store now, they bypass their grocery store, they buy their meat, and next week when they go grocery shopping, where do you think they go? Back, they're someone else's customer. I just fill their freezer on meat though. I'm a happy man. If that's all they want to buy from me, that's okay. My meat truckload sales never generate less than 25 to 28% gross profit. Not bad volume, not bad gross profit for that type of volume. I don't want to live with a 25% gross every day, every week of the year. My average gross profit in my meat department is in the mid 30s, running a discount program. Now you guys might be running better, you might be running less. But I'll, I'll go to the bank with the gross dollars that I generate at the end of the year. Anyway, this truckload sale, we run them six times a year now. We used to run them once, then we went to three, then we went to four. The heck with it, we're going to six every other month. We can't fill their freezers more than every other month. It's a little bit too much, okay? We run it the third week of the month. We can't run them on the first of the month. I couldn't handle the volume. I couldn't do a first of the month business and a truckload sale. It'd be too much for me, okay? We have five full-time meat cutters that do this, okay? We increase the labor on the case, not the butchers. The butchers don't need the help. They're cutting whole primals. They're cutting $100 pieces of meat, okay? It's slice, 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 put in a package, wrap it, please bring it out. They'll bring it back to the meat cutter. John, uh, the girl in the blue hat, 
This is hers, five pieces. Uh, the guy with the glasses on, this is his. They mark on the package, on the primal, well, how to slice it and everything else, and they slice it accordingly, okay? The only truckload sale we don't run on the third week of the month is December. On December truckload sale, we do run it on the first week of the month. We can handle that one. It's our lightest truckload sale of the year. But we tie it into a seafood truckload sale. And the main focus of that truckload sale, now every truckload sale includes every one of the items I mentioned in the meat department. This is not pick and choose. This is, I have guys that try to duplicate me and run five items. You didn't run a truckload sale, you ran a selective sale, okay? A truckload sale has every single item. But, but come Christmas time, the emphasis is on prime rib. I want to take my competition's customer out of the marketplace for prime rib before they do. Very few chains are going to advertise prime rib the first week of December. They might have had them listed for Thanksgiving, okay? But their Christmas price isn't out yet. And I sell them a whole seven ribs. They got to buy a seven rib piece of meat. Now, I'll custom cut it. You need to roast five ribs for the holidays, not a problem. We bone it, we tie it, do anything you want with it, slice the rest of it, not a problem, okay? But they're someone else's customer. They just put prime rib. It turned out I doubled my prime rib sales for the holidays by doing this. Because I only, not only sold my everyday customers that came in at Christmas time with a special order, I sold my competition's customers at the same time. It was well worth the effort, believe me. Now, the other one thing that we do do ties into your program of a dollar store competing against the dollar stores. We run a $1 sale. Over the years, we've sold everything we can in the meat department for $1, $1 a pound, $1 a piece, whatever we could find. Man, we got imaginative. Four days after Easter, we always run a... Uh, a four-day sale that everything on that flyer has to be a dollar. One year we sold boneless chicken breast at a dollar a pound. You know how much boneless chicken breast you sell in four days at a dollar a pound? 10,800 pounds. Everyone else is looking for business. I was straight out, okay? On an average truckload, I sell more than that now at a much higher price, okay? Anyway, we're on a dollar sale. Everything on the front page is a dollar, every department. Nowadays, we can't do the meat anymore. So what we do is we run one, two, three. We run dollar items, which might be a packaged item, chicken, poultry, something like that, split chicken breast uh, as, at a dollar, several of those. We'll run at least two or three items at $2, maybe a pork item, country style sparrows, boneless, boneless Seneca pork chops when the price is right, bone-in pork chops, whatever we can. $3 item, usually a red meat item. Okay? And what happened? Instead of hurting us in sales, it increased our sales. Because now instead of selling items at a dollar a pound, we're selling them at two and three dollars a pound. Everything else on the front page is still a dollar. And it still competes against the uh, dollar stores because the perception is a dollar's cheap. They're advertising it, right? Who am I to knock their advertising? I'm just going with it. I'm riding on the tail of it. The next thing we do do that's a little bit unique is it's not a sale, but it's an everyday. Now, I know you guys have your pick five, and if I've seen pick five programs. I assume it's five packages or something for a fixed price. This is my answer to it. I'm, I'm not saying against the pick five. This one I'm able to control a little bit better, though. When I first bought the store, they sold meat bundles. And a meat bundle was a certain amount of items for a fixed price. They sold, and these aren't the exact items, but you get the idea. Two pounds of split chicken breast, two pounds of stew meat, two pounds of hamburg, uh, two pounds of kielbasa, two pounds of pork of something, maybe two pounds of hot dogs. For $29.99 every month, you could come in, you could buy that packaged. Package. Next month, the customer bought it. They came back and they said, you know, I love the meat I bought from you last month. It was good quality, but I didn't use the kielbasa. That's still in my freezer. I want to get another bundle. Do I have to get kielbasa again? Or do I have to get stew meat again? Can I substitute it for something else? What do you think they want to substitute it for? Ribeye steak and porterhouse steak, right? Can't do it. So every month, I'm trying to figure out financially how to substitute the item to equal the same price as what they're taking out of the bundle. I said, the heck with this. 28 years ago, I decided, I said, my time's more valuable than that. I want something that's going to help the customer and me at the same time. It wouldn't be any good if it just helped me. It has to help the customer. So I came up with Bob's Meat Menu. Bob's Meat Menu has four different bundles. You can see them at the top. Bundle one, two, three, and four. If you buy bundle one, you get to choose any three items from column A, any three items from column B, and any one item from column C. All the way up to bundle four, that's five, five, three, and three. Now let me explain the columns. Each column has eight different items in it. You can pick and choose. Every item in each column has the approximate same retail value that we set for it. Okay, so we're happy no matter what item they pick. It doesn't bother us. Some have a little bit more profit in it, but that's okay. The mix is going to be there, right? Every item in column B has the same value as everything else in column B. Every item in column C, the same value there. Same D is the same there. So when a customer comes in, they get to pick and choose just like your pick five. What do I want for my value? Okay, they get to pick and choose. Now here's my advantage. 
I get to pick and choose too. Okay? When they walk in the door, they, I've trained my customers to order these a day ahead of time. Usually I sell these on the first of the month, big first of the month item. So my customer calls on the end of the month, says, uh, for Tuesday I want to bundle number four. Okay, not a problem. John, my meat manager, walks in Tuesday morning, he might have 15 meat bundles to do. And they're usually the big ones, number threes and number fours. Okay? He culls his case, takes everything out of it that's non-saleable. Okay? Everything that's left is fair game for the, for the meat bundles. He gets to go through the case and pick and choose product that was probably cut yesterday at our volume that he can use in the meat bundles. It's good quality product. We were going to sell it today in the case if they didn't take it and put it in the bundle. But what do I get to do? I get to control shrink and I get to fresh cut all over again. So when my customer walks in my case, walks in my store and looks at my case, they got quality product to look at. It's fresh. It makes, it encourages sales for the next day. Okay? So by doing it this way, I've controlled I've helped my gross profit by eliminating shrink. I get to pick and choose the product that's going in, right? I've made the customer happy. Now, guess what? I've also taken the customer out of the marketplace from the chain stores in Walmart, because guess where my, my first of the month customers buy their groceries? It's not me, guys. It's at Walmart. I offer them an alternative. They can't afford the whole ribeye that I sell on my truckload sale, but they can know they can afford somewhere between the 37 and the uh, 99 to turn around and be able to, you know, buy that. They can gear it to themselves and they get to pick and choose what's in it. I just get to pick, pick the particular item and to control the weight and everything else. I know exactly what my gross profit is doing in this. Last year, selling these on the first of the month, which as I said, they all average pretty much in the first week of the month. We did about $60,000 doing these meat bundles uh, in a store that most, an item that most other stores don't carry, okay? Uh, this is our email campaign that's unique. Um, and part of the Help Save the Butcher program and the new program that we just went out with, it has, a, has an app for members that pushes to them. And my tech guy keeps telling me, see, you know, you gotta use the app more, you gotta use the app more. I have 40 something hundred email customers that ask to get my flyer on a weekly basis. These aren't people I solicited, they requested it, okay? Over 4,000. They want my flyer every week. They want to see what's on sale because our customers are so far away. We got to, you know, they, I can't, I distribute 10,000 flyers a week. I can't do more than that. The cost is prohibitive. The email campaign costs me $50 a month though, right? That's the advertising cost for my email campaign, $50 a month, as opposed to how many thousands for my flyers that are going out, right? Well, anyway, they request the flyer on a weekly basis. We have several hundred more that request our special events flyers, which are our truckload flyers and this here. This is our cutting program from the Help Save the Butcher program, helpsavethebutchers.com, okay? It's how to cut different pieces of meat. These aren't geared towards butchers. These are geared towards the customer, okay? I just bought a whole boneless ribeye in truckload sale. I wanna to try to cut it. We call these macho guys. The guy that came in with his girlfriend just bought a tenderloin, he says, don't worry about it, I can do it, okay? And you gotta to explain to them, make sure you take the silver skin off, make sure you do this and everything else, the whole bit, because we don't want them to, and it's not that I'm afraid they're gonna hack the meat up. I don't want them to leave the silver skin on because I don't want them to bite into it and say the tenderloin he sold me was no good. I want them to be happy with the product. I don't want them to slice a ribeye and not trim the fat and turn around and get it on the grill and the girlfriend turns around and the wife says to him, says, yeah, look at all the fat they sold us. You know, we don't want them to do that. So we would rather cut it ourselves. So our truckload sale, I gotta tell you what we do with our email campaign. Our truckload sale runs from Friday to Thursday. All our ads do. We, we, we do not run Sunday to, uh, anyone running still Sunday to Saturday ads in here? Run out, great, all right. We used to be able to run Sunday to Saturday. And Saturday night, we're gearing down on this sale, and then we gotta bring in the product to have product ready for Sunday. So we have an out-of-stock condition on our busiest day of the week on sale items because we don't wanna own them next week, right? Or, you know, if it's not a great product, there's always gonna, I don't care how good you are in ordering, you're gonna have an out-of-stock. So we run our ads from Friday to the following Thursday night. This way here, we jam in the product on Thursday, Thursday delivery and Saturday delivery to make sure we got plenty of product. And when the customers come in, we have them. Our truckload sales are the same way. I mean, God, the Tuesday delivery before a truckload literally is a trailer truck, okay? I mean, the meat's coming in. You know, give me 30 boxes of top sirloins, give me 20 boxes of ribeyes. I went through, a, well, we're gonna talk about Hamburg. I went through 100 boxes of uh, grinding meats this week, okay? Um, Anyway, we sent out our email campaign a week ahead of time to our email customers. We want them to feel special on the truckload. So a week ahead, I send out this email to them that shows the front page and the meat page. And I said, as a truckload customer, I want to give you a preview of what's coming up next week. Or as an email customer, I want to give you a preview of what's coming up. Okay? So they get that a week ahead of time. Now, normally on Thursday night, the email goes out for the ad. We send it on Wednesday this week instead. Okay? And we tell our email customer, for being an email customer, we want to give you a benefit. 
we're going to allow you to come into our store on Thursday instead of Friday when the ad starts and everyone else is coming in so you can get the sale items a day ahead of time and beat the crowds. We pick up about an extra 15000 in meat business doing it that way. Not a bad idea, huh? Gave them something and we benefit at the same time. It's got to be a win-win situation. If you're doing anything that's not win-win, you're making a mistake. All right? We took care of our customers. Along with it, we send out this email. And this is our How to Cut videos that are part of the Help Save the Butcher program is available to our members that teaches the customers that want to cut it themselves how to cut it properly. Or, as it says, or you can have our butchers do it for you. Okay? But it is a unique program that I don't think you're going to get the change to be able to compete against. Now, talking about perception, we're going to talk about selling the sizzle, okay? Perception is everything in business. But don't leave it up to chance. Don't turn around and assume your customer thinks what you think your store is. You have an idea of what you are, okay? Don't assume the customer thinks the same. When I put out that box on the suggestion on the front end, I thought they were shopping my store for the meat only. No, it turns out they were shopping it because of my employees. It made me realize where I need to put my emphasis to keep the customers coming back, okay? Never assume, perception is everything. We don't leave anything to chance. This is my meat aisle on the top right, uh, top picture there. It says, help save the butchers, help save fresh cut meat. The butchers of Wyndham IGA sell meat that is fresh cut in our store every day. I don't want that to be a whisper campaign. I want that in their face. I want them to know this meat was cut fresh, it was cut here. We also, in the one below, it's above our chicken case, says we sell 100% fresh beef, pork, chicken, lamb, and veal. It tells them that it has no additives. It tells them that the chain stores are selling a meat that was cut hundreds of miles away, that the hamburg was ground somewhere else. Our hamburg was ground in our store fresh every day. We have a, case, a sign on our case that says five reasons you need to be buying our hamburg. It was ground fresh. It was from meat that we cut here. And a whole other list, and I can't remember off the top of my head. I love doing things like this. And if you're not doing them and telling the customer what you stand for, you're not only shorting yourself in business, you're shorting the customer because that might be an important thing to that customer. That all of a sudden they said, finally, I found a store that agrees with what I believe in. That there's a reason for them. I, I got a reason to go back to that store. Remember, you got to get them back in. You just can't give them a sale item, right? On the upper right-hand side, that's one of the two uh, TVs that run in our store all the time. And that one there showing right now is one of the butcher things that I did, okay? We also run some of our commercials on there from the Help Save the Butcher program and our specific store commercials. For years, we did TV commercials. Can't afford to do them anymore. The web is just as good, especially if you got an email campaign. I can send out commercials anytime I want. And, you should, and I know through the company that I use exactly how many people opened it, when they opened it, an early response on it, uh, how many watched it, how many clicked it, how many forwarded it to a friend. My email campaign grows on a weekly basis. I get a report every week that says, this is, there's always going to be someone that drops out that doesn't look at it. Three people dropped out, 14 more signed up, 13 more signed up, 10 more signed up. The sign up is always larger than the dropout because people are forwarding it to other friends. Hey, did you see what's on sale at IGA? Hey, did you see the cutting videos? Hey, did you see the truckload sales coming? Okay. Sell the sizzle in your store on a daily basis. Now, it's all good advertising, okay, and everything else. And sometimes people, as much as I enjoy doing this, my focus is not to be a showman and not to turn around and say, hey, look at me, although I want them to, okay. I just want to get them in my store. I want them to see what I have to offer. I want them to see what I offer in my meat case and the quality and the price, okay? When I first went into my own store, I think I did what most other retailers would do. I came out of the Edwards Food Warehouse. I was used to selling large packages of meat. So I started a family pack section. Now, what do you put in your family pack section? The low price items, right? 80% lean ground beef, hopefully no one's selling a 73, right? 80% lean ground beef, maybe a chicken leg quarter in a 10 pound bag maybe drumsticks, maybe country style spirits, maybe assorted pork chops, or the infamous package that absolutely bugs me. And I apologize if anyone's doing this, don't take offense. It's like a whole eye round that three steaks been taken off of a four steaks and they make that a family pack. You ever take home an eye round steak and eat it? You better be a good cook, okay? Because don't serve it to company, you know? All right, so we're just putting packages in to fill the case. Well, we did the same thing in the beginning because I never thought that people that wanted um, family packs would buy 90% lean ground beef. No, no, that's for the people that want to save money, right? Well, I started a family pack program that ended up being on quality product. My motto is quality product at a reasonable price, okay? The upper left-hand corner, that's thin cut, center cut, pork chops, and a family pack package. There's 12 chops in that package. 
I also put out a thick cut center cut pork chop in a family pack with eight. I put out a boneless center cut pork chop in a family pack, a boneless pork sirloin chop in a family pack, country style spare ribs in a family pack. Of course, I have assorted chops in a family pack. I have boneless country style spare ribs in a family pack. I regularly sell out of my case whole bone in pork loins, whole boneless pork loins, whole things of uh, fresh, genuine spare ribs in a three pack. Who am I to decide what my customer won't buy? I give them the option. Now, along with this, I also carry small packages on everything I mentioned. I'm not telling them, don't get the wrong idea here. I'm not strictly a family pack store. But where are my sales generated? From here. Because it's quality product at a reasonable price. And everyone likes to save money. And I'm going to explain that to you in a little while. The upper right-hand corner, that's not Chuck stew. That's round stew. Of course, we carry Chuck stew in a family pack. But we also carry round stew. Bottom right-hand corner, just an example of, uh, of a, a steak in a family pack. We also sell singles. We have a whole bunch of steaks in family pack. It's probably 75% of my total meat volume comes out of either family packs or primals, okay? And it's a lot less labor to put together, and it can, helps control supply cost, okay? Helps control shrink, because you don't have different packages out there. You're selling them together. Now, there's a secret to cutting family pack, you know, to make sure the product looks good and everything else that a lot of stores don't follow. Uh, the secret is, is to make sure that the product looks like each other. You wouldn't put two steaks, one from the beginning of a package, or one from the beginning of a primal, and one from the end of the primal in the same package. You right? want them to be twins. Symmetry. As much as people don't, some people are artsy and they like things to change. I like symmetry. I like things to look the same all the time. I want to, once I find a way to do something, I'm going to consistently do that until I find a better way. Then I'm going to consistently do that. Then until I find a better way, I'm going to consistently do that. Symmetry, they got to look like each other. Bottom left hand corner, that's round cube steaks in a family pack package. Big item for us and our customers. And as I said, that's not 80% lean ground beef in the middle, that's 90%. That's two of the three packages that we sell in our family pack session. That's a one pound package and a three pound package in 90% uh, in, uh, lean ground beef. We sell it in all our grinds. We sell an 80, an 85, and a 90, and we also offer patties in every variety. Don't assume your customer only buys chuck patties. We sell ground patties, chuck patties, sirloin patties on a regular basis every day, okay? You gotta offer them variety to choose from. Now over the course of the year, we average about 30% gross profit on this item, okay? Depending, now we, we go through a lot of boneless chicken breasts, don't get me wrong, we sell a lot of them, so we can negotiate with our wholesaler on a regular basis, especially if you're buying by the pallets, okay? I booked, for my truckload sale this week, just over five pallets of boneless chicken breast. Five pallets, okay? That's the booking, I'm coming up short. I'm selling more than I can. Now I gotta go out and find them. And I'm gonna take a hit on the price, and I know that, but I'm not gonna disappoint the customer. I'm gonna make sure I have them, okay? I was already, I've been up since five o'clock this morning. I was on the phone with my meat department at six, going over the orders and what we had. I know what's in there. I know what we're selling, okay? This is a destination item at $1.99 a pound. People from other stores know that you have that. At 30% gross profit, I don't care if it's the only thing they buy when they come in my store. I just made 30% gross, okay? And it didn't take a meat cutter to put it in the case. It took a clerk. The clerk bags it, wraps it, and puts it out. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? Nothing wrong with 30% gross profit. Over the course of last year, we sold $141,000 in an item most other stores tell me their customers won't buy. I don't know, my customers are different, I guess. Eastern Connecticut, that little section we're in, they, don't, they buy different things. Well, several years ago, I was speaking for the IGA Coca-Cola Institute out in San Diego. We went out there and lucky enough to go out there and spend some time past few years speaking with IGA Coca-Cola doing their meat uh, presentation. Uh, and when I was out there, I had a gentleman in the audience that, um, let's say, um, he kind of disagreed with some of the things I said. He said, I can't do $100,000 in meat business and uh, with only five meat cutters. I said, I can, because I do it all the time. Okay? He said, well, you know, you can't do it. I said, look, he says, how do you do it then? I said, well, I sell a lot of whole things. I sell 10-pound bags of boneless chicken breast. I sell whole primals. Uh, I sell anything big I can. See, I'm willing to give a value to my customer. I want one thing in return. I want a sale. I don't want to have to, I'll give you a price. You want a small package, I'm going to charge you the same price everyone else is charging. Okay? You want to buy quality product from me, and you want a good value on it, you got to buy quantity. Okay? And believe me, the people are out there. They will come out of the woodwork to buy from you. They might not be your customers right now. See, the decision that ends up happening with a lot of people is I put it out, the, the great old meat cutter saying, I tried that once. Didn't work. And that's probably why it didn't work. You tried it once. You've got to be consistent and persistent in business. You never do anything for less than 13 weeks. 13 weeks is the key as far as I'm concerned to make sure that something works. 
You put this in your case every day, one package at a time, one package at a time. Did it sell? Did it sell? I don't like the idea of one package, but I did do that in Hamburg, and we're going to be talking about it, okay? But the idea of it is, if you put out five of these, six of these, and give it a section, tomorrow morning, come in, rotate them. Put them where somewhere else where you know you're going to sell. Put out six fresh ones, okay? But have them out there. Let the customer decide whether or not they want to buy them, not you. It's not your decision. It's their decision. It's their money. Your decision is whether or not to carry them. It's up to you, okay? Anyway, uh, we devise this. Well, this gentleman's talking to me. He says, you can't do that. I said, yes, I can. I explained to him. When we came up with the idea, I said to my wife on the way home on the plane, I normally take my wife when I speak. Uh, I don't like being married 36 years, six children and 21 grandchildren. I have a hard time being alone. I had to take my nephew with me to record me today, right? So anyway, I normally take my wife with me. And on the way home on the plane, I said to my wife, I said, we need another destination item. And we came up with the idea of a 10-pound bag of Hamburg, but not 80% lean. 90% lean. Um, and the reason for the 90% goes back to the quality product at a reasonable price. Anyone can sell your customer a large package of low quality Hamburg, okay? And the customer is going to thank you, maybe, or they might come back and say, well, that was too fatty or something like this, complain about it or whatever. I don't know. But I'll tell you what, you're going to have to sell it at a lower price, okay? But if I give them quality product at a reasonable price, next week when they want to buy five porterhouse steaks to feed the neighbors, who do you think they're going to think of? Okay? They're going to come to me. Or next week when they want to buy a whole boneless ribeye that isn't truckload sale time because they're going to feed a lot of people, who do you think they think of? Okay? I like this. Three back, one forward, okay? The idea of it is, is to build a relationship with the customer. Okay? We started doing this. Now, I was lucky enough that year to have, I was here in Laurel and I spoke in 2008 at your, one of your seminars, and I had reported we had just started this. Okay, and in the first five months coming into this program, okay, um, I reported to you guys, we put out one package at a time. And that sold and we put out another package because Hamburg I didn't want to risk. What can I do with it after? Okay, put out one package at a time. And in five months we sold $14,000 of that new package. You want to know what I sold last year in this package that I didn't sell four and a half years ago? $172,000. Is it worth it, guys? It's the highest grossing item in my store. It's the highest SKU out of any item that I sell. That generates more volume, and the average gross profit is 25% over the course of the year. Now, the market changes, and I realize that. You gotta be willing to take the hit when you have to. You gotta know when to move when you have to and everything else. But I gotta tell you a couple of stories about this uh, Hamburg, okay? Two things, in 2008, later that year, we were lucky enough that we were nominated and we're one of the IGA USA retailers of the year for 2009. And I was very proud of that. And when, if you guys have been through it, you know Mark Botanic or, 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 uh, or Doug Fritch comes to your store and looks at what you do, okay? Mark comes into my store. And he looks at this package in my case and he says to me, he says, Bob, who the heck buys that? And me not thinking twice, I looked at Mark and I said, Mark, you make good money, don't you? And he looked at me and said, I said, Mark, I apologize. I said, what I meant was, you make good money, but you still appreciate a value. He said, yeah. I said, well, that's the type of person that buys it. I said, it's a $30 package. At the time, we we're making 33% gross profit on it. We're, making, we're paying less than $2 to buy the product we're grinding. Okay? I said, if that's all they buy, I don't care. I made $10 on that package. Right? Well, at that point there, and I could not have paid someone to do this, this little old lady that was walking hunchback walked up to my meat case, and I swear to God, this happened. This is not an exaggeration. She picked up a 10-pound bag of, of a Hamburg, and I thought she was going to fall over from the weight of that Hamburg and walked up to front and bought it. And I looked at Mark, and I said, there you go. There you go. It is unbelievable what this thing will do for you. Now, I want to prove to you that my truckload customer is not my everyday customer. I sell these every day for $2.99 a pound. That was my volume last year. I used to sell them in truckload sales at $2.67 a pound. Obviously, the market was a lot less, okay? Then I couldn't handle it at $2.67. I went to $2.77 on truckload sales. That got hairy. I said, okay, we went to $2.88 a pound. That got hairy. We tried something different this year. I went to $2.98 a pound. I discounted it one penny. One penny. The June truckload sale. I sold over $20,000 in an item that I discounted one penny in one week. It's not my customers, guys, that are buying it. It's someone else's customers. My customers buy it on a weekly basis, and we generate a lot of sales, but they know it's $2.99. So they're not going to buy it for a penny savings. They're going to buy something else that's on sale. 
why, why, saved, uh, why save money on for a penny? It's only saving 10 cents, right? So they'll buy the ribeye of the tenderloin. I can get the hamburg next week. I don't have to worry about that. It's not a sense of urgency. But a customer traveling an hour and a half to come to my store to buy meat for a truckload sale realizes the value of 90% lean ground beef in a 10 pound package at $2.98 a pound. That's a good value to that customer. They say, wow, look at this, and put four of them in their carriage. Not one. I've seen carriages four or five. It's not an exaggeration. They buy, they fill their freezers. And when they want quality meat, they know where to come. They will go out of their way. And if they have a special event at home, and even if it's not truckload sale, they're going to come to me. I get calls from them on off weeks of the truckload sale asking me questions about meat and what I do. Back in the year 2000, uh, we started the Help Save the Butcher program. Now, we've been running truckload sales for quite a while out of my store, way before 2000, back in the mid-90s when we went back to one store. Uh, we've been doing all the other things we talked about in my store just by instinct. I've got to tell you, this is my life. I don't know if you guys realize, I mean, I've been a butcher since I was 15 years old. It is the only thing I did. I insisted all my kids go to college so that way there they had an option. Now, we have one son that stays in, stayed in the business and is running the store now for us most of the time. But I mean, I, get, I wanted them to have an option. I didn't have an option, but I've got to tell you, I enjoyed what I did. I enjoy talking to people. I enjoy, and I don't mean just like this. I mean my customers. I enjoy working with them and everything else. But my growth didn't start until I started the Help Save the Butcher program in 2000, and I'm going to explain why. Okay? We started with double-digit growth from 2000 on. That's what built a new store. That's what took so long. We didn't have a way of getting to the customer and telling them what we stood for, and that's what we were able to devise. We started a program that gave us credibility with our customers. They said, ah, these guys are unique. They're different. We weren't. We were you guys. We were the guys running a quality meat department. Then when our customers came in the door, they knew what they could expect. But we told them in a way that was totally different what we stood for, that it made it stand out in their mind. And they made, it made them realize it just wasn't for us. It was for them also. It involved the customer. I had people walking in my store saying, I'm here to help save a butcher. And they realized it wasn't my job they were saving. They were saving fresh cut meat. They were saving quality. They were saving the idea of having somewhere there, someone there to go to. We instantly started building business. It made us unique in the marketplace, got us publicity. Uh, we built our business, double digit growth. And I gotta tell you, I have a pet peeve, a really big pet peeve in any store I go into. If I know more about what I'm buying than the person selling it, it bugs me. You go into a store, you're not really sure about something, you need some info. Okay, you, you, you got a good idea what's going on, but you want to find out just a little bit more so you can make your buying decision. You walk into that store and you ask the clerk and they don't know anything, does that bother anyone else in this room? Bothers the heck out of me, okay? So when we created the Help Save the Butcher program, that's what we were saving for the customer. The ability for them to walk in our store and have someone there of knowledge that could share with them, help them make their buying decisions that help them get the right quality product at the best possible price and took care of their family. That's what made the Help Save the Butcher program work. It wasn't help save the butchers, help save the butchers. It was getting them to realize what we did, okay? And we're gonna show you some of the other things we do with this, but it gave us a unique identity. Now, like I said, everyone else in the area was, a lot of them were doing the same thing. They just didn't know how to get to the customer. Uh, we learned how to sell the sizzle. Back in 1984, when I got the financing for my store, it was a Friday night, 8 o'clock, in the vice president of the bank's living room. He looked at me, he looked at my, uh, my credentials, what I had done all the years in the business, all my experience. He looked at the fact that I had a $5,000 down payment, and the thing that made him decide was my father-in-law's co-signature. Isn't that great, guys? All my years of work and hard work and effort. He said, ah, well, the loan's guaranteed. Okay, you got it. Then he said to me, he said, you won't be successful until you learn how to sell the sizzle and not the steak. Now, you've got to understand what that means, okay? This is not hoopla, okay? Anyone can sell a steak at a reasonable price. If you want to sell porterhouse steak next week at $4.99, you'll lose your shirt, but you'll sell it, okay? The week after, if someone else sells it for $4.49, where's your customer going? Somewhere else. I have to sell them a value. I have to sell them a reason to come back to my store. That's selling the sizzle. We tell our customers point blank, if you've been buying meat anywhere else, you just haven't been paying attention. We, our meat is cut fresh each day right here. We sell 100% meat with no additives. Our hamburger is ground fresh daily, and we have butchers to answer your questions. Our prices are low, and our quality is high. Sometimes you have to be blunt in business, but it works, and it's, it's, it's a mutual benefit thing. Remember that. This is our butcher that stands in front of our deli in our primal case. Uh, in our store, we promote with enthusiasm. We do it in a way that the customer can remember, and we involve the customer. Very important. That's what the program is about, to generate, you know, 
excitement about being in your store, generate a loyalty to your store for fresh meat. That's what you want to generate with these customers. Now, I believe the next thing here, this is a cutting video. Uh, most of our cutting videos run about five minutes. This is just to give you an idea of what we do with the program. Uh, this one runs one minute, uh, just to give you an idea of how we cut and everything else of what we do with the customers. Help save the butcher! Help save the butcher! Hi, this is Bob from HelpSaveTheButchers.com and today I'm going to show you how to slice a whole boneless ribeye. I have a boneless ribeye in front of me. First thing I want to do is I want to mark it off. It's important that the steaks are even when you slice them, so that way they cook evenly. There we go, nice and easy. Don't push hard on the knife. Let the knife do the work for you. Then when you get it halfway through, pull back. Don't lift up on the knife. If you lift up on your knife like this, it's going to make ridges in the steak. Now, if you were going to cut a roast out of this, the half that I would cut the roast out of is the chuck half. Has a little bit more fat to it, and the fat would melt into the roast, keeping it nice and juicy. So that's our roast part right there. And we're going to take this here. Now what we're going to do is going to take the top of the eye to the point of the tip, and we're just going to take a slice of any excess fat off of there. Nice and easy. There you go, whole boneless ribeye, nice and easy to slice. This end is a roast, this end is steaks. Great eating. And as my wife likes to say, real men eat ribeye. I know I do. This is Bob from HelpSaveTheButchers.com. Don't forget, buy fresh cut meat from your local butcher, just like your mom did. That's one of our eight videos that we run in the store on a regular basis in our email campaign and through the Help Save the Butcher program. Um, this here is one of the uh, commercials that we run for the Help Save the Butcher. It's a little bit funny, but it gets a point across to the customer. So, Gotta love a barbecue. Did your butcher cut that for you? No. I don't have a butcher. Rose got it when she was at the store buying shoe. What is wrong with you? Don't taint your grill with that. You look like you need a hand finding a good steak. Please help me. Be my pleasure. Come with me. Now where'd you get that? The superstore? No. My butcher cut this for me. Now that is a steak. Real men eat real steak. If you've been buying your meat anywhere else, you just haven't been paying attention. Help save the butcher! Honey? Is that what you plan on serving my parents tonight? Yeah. That's from the superstore. Do they even have a butcher there? No. But I did get this cute blouse while I was there. Excuse me. Yes, ma'am. Do you know about meats or do you just work here? Of course I know about meats. I'm a butcher. Come with me. I'll be glad to help you. Great. Thank you. If you've been buying your meat anywhere else, you just haven't been paying attention. Help save the butcher! Uh, you know, running a meat department, running a quality meat department, running the Help Save the Butcher program, and someone said it earlier, uh, Mr. Butler did about about making sure it's not an easy program, and it's not. I don't want I don't want you to think it's it's not easy to do good fresh meat business. I'll tell you what, like I said, our last truck close sale was 165,000 in meat business. It's a lot of work. Okay, the rewards are there though, and can the competition compete against it? No way in the world. When my son decided to come into the business, he went to work for Stop and Shop, and uh, he graduates college. Says after he goes out in the business world for a while selling stock, comes back and says, Dad, I decided I want to be in the grocery business. I said, fantastic. That's great to know. He said, good. He said, I got a job at Stop and Shop. <laughs> he said, holy cow. I think his mother was going to cry, right? At that point there, you know, I realized the value of it, though. He spent two years with them in their management training. And, uh, and we, were, we were a small store at the time. Uh, I mean, we're small compared to all these superstores around us. Stop and Shop was a brand new store. And he walked into the Stop and Shop in, in Willimantic up the street from us, and he was just there for the day, and he saw our flyer on the wall. And he says, wow, you got my dad's flyer on the wall? He says, hey, when he runs a truckload sale, we lose meat business. 
running the Help Save the Butcher program and running a good quality meat department is a lot like karate. Karate, yes, okay. Karate, no, okay. Okay? Karate maybe doesn't work. Running a good quality meat department maybe doesn't work either. Okay? It's a lot of work, but I'll tell you what. Last year was our best year in business. This year is way ahead of last year. We've been growing steadily. When I was here in 2008, our good weeks were 100. Now they're 150 plus, okay? It's a steady growing. What I offer you is an opportunity to run a good quality meat department, tell your customers about it, and obtain sustained growth. Not just this week's sale item. You don't want that, you want sustained growth. I invite you to go to the site, helpsavethebutchers.com, and I invite you to join me in my quest to help save the butchers. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it.